how it got out of Zionism. So this is obviously a much longer conversation and a much longer story. But for the sake of brevity, I'll try to tell this as the Alter Rebbe says, the first rabbi of Chabad, I'll try to tell the long, short version of how this happened. So in 2018, when I was 20 years old, I was studying in Jerusalem in an all-male religious nationalist seminary. And obviously I grew up very Zionist. And while I was there, I started having questions about the entire population that existed beyond these walls. And as part of my program, there were individuals who were doing this interesting program where folks actually met Palestinians and heard some of their perspectives. And for me, I had heard some good things about that program and some of the things that they were saying were interesting and appealing, so I decided to go to that program. And I remember is, it was a Friday before Shabbos, and I was sitting there at 9 a.m. in Jerusalem, and a Palestinian man had come to speak to us. And he was describing how he had to get up at 4.30 a.m. to make it to Jerusalem at 9 a.m. Even though he lived in Ramallah, which is only like seven miles away. So obviously my brain goes, well, that doesn't make any sense. Surely it shouldn't take you more than four hours to go seven miles. And then I listened how he proceeded to talk about the system of checkpoints, how he had to get on a separate bus, how he had to make the calculation of whether it made more sense for him to stay on the bus, knowing that if he's on the bus, he could be kicked off the bus at the checkpoint and go to the back of the line, or if it just made sense to just wait on the non-bus part of the checkpoint to get through to make sure that he got here in time to speak to a bunch of Zionist Jews to try to convince them that Palestinians were humans. So after the lecture, I went up to him. I was like, dude, this is fucked up. What is going on here? Why did no one tell me about this? And I was like, can you just like, I didn't even know what to, I was like, can you, like more, just more. Tell me more. He took out his ID card and he's like, yeah, I actually have to head back now because if I'm not back by a certain time, my provisional travel status is going to get revoked and I won't be able to leave Ramallah again. And it doesn't matter if the checkpoints held me up. I mean, checkpoints could take three to four hours. So I need to head back now. I'm like, dude, it's, it's 1030 or 11 o'clock. He's like, I can't take any chances. Like, I, I'm not risking this getting revoked. So I said to him, I was like, I need to know more. He said, well, why don't you come with me to Ramallah? So I'll tell you, the first thought that rose in my mind was rising and said, if I go, you will kill me. Because that was the way I was conditioned. Growing up, for me, Palestinians were terrorists. There was no possibility that a Palestinian was human, and certainly no possibility that Palestinian resistance had nothing to do with Jewish folks, but had to do with the fact that there were settlers kicking Palestinians off their land, upholding apartheid, ethnic cleansing, and genocide. So as that thought was rising, there was another voice in me, and I think this voice is a deep ancestral voice, and to this day, I'm amazed at myself that in, I was able to challenge all of my conditioning with the second voice, a, a deeper voice, a deeper knowing, and that voice immediately said, well, you've been told your whole life that this person was going to kill you and that this person was a terrorist and he wasn't human. And he's standing right in front of you and he's the exact opposite of those things. And in that moment, I didn't vocalize that thought and I called bullshit and I said, yeah, I'll come. I'll come. I need to see it for myself. Now, as a Zionist kid growing up, this was unheard of. The thought that I could go to a Palestinian town and come back in anything less than a body bag was absurd. So, but he said, you got to come in the next couple of days. So this was Friday. So I had Shabbos in Yerushalayim. And then Sunday is a work day in the Israeli settler colony. So I went to Yeshiva. I went to Gemara in the morning. I think we were holding in Kedushin. And then during lunch, I took off my kippah, I put on the hat, and I went to Shar Shechem, which is Damascus Gate. The only place I wasn't allowed to go to when I was in Yeshiva for fear that Palestinians would kill me. And the second I stepped into Damascus Gate, I essentially, I, 
don't want to say became Palestinian. That's ridiculous. I had tremendous privilege as a settler, but I got to taste, maybe instead of a drop in the ocean, I got to taste the mist surrounding one drop in the ocean of what it's like to be subject to a settler colonial regime. And I got on a Palestinian bus. And for me, I was like, well, this is interesting that it's a completely different busing system. But even more than that, it's like I, all of a sudden, was with the people who were supposed to kill me. And in fact, the very opposite happened, where when I was on a Palestinian bus, all of a sudden, my sense of identity and belonging started to become Palestinian in terms of my sense of where my safety lies. And my sense of threat immediately became, holy shit, I'm on a Palestinian bus. I am being read as Palestinian in a fucking genocidal settler colony. I am about to go through an hour and a half of military checkpoints in knowing that this occupying army can do whatever they want to me. And the only protection I have is an American passport, which is way more than any Palestinian has. And I was still terrified. And I remember the process of just like this image of a Palestinian father being comforted by his daughter. And this man's probably 65 years old. And just me just realizing in that moment, like the deep humiliation that this person had to undergo. And he was someone privileged who was able to leave Ramallah to Jerusalem. And I remember just going through the Columbia checkpoint, all IDF soldiers coming on, harassing us. And I remember going into the Columbia checkpoint and being on the inside of the wall and seeing the beautiful graffiti and seeing that there was a, a graffiti of someone, a kid with a slingshot. And my Jewish brain at the time said, wow, this is amazing. The Quran and the Torah are so similar. They also have an image of King David with a slingshot. And then after that, the bus kept going and the slingshot was pointed at an IDF soldier. And that's when it started to crumble for me where I said, wait a second, who's who here? Who's David and who's Goliath? These are the same rocks that my ancestors used to resist oppression. And now these rocks of Palestine are being used by Palestinians to resist oppression too. And we have become our worst nightmare. I remember sitting in a bar in Ramallah. Sorry, the Israeli security apparatus. I don't remember who it was. But if you could find him for me, that would be lovely because I dearly miss him and he changed my life. I remember sitting in a bar in Ramallah. And... This person just explaining to me, this beautiful Palestinian human just explaining to me, being so patient with me, speaking to a Zionist settler, speaking to me and just saying, like, dude, like, most people here have never seen Jerusalem. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's literally right there. It's like you have to be a male and 65 or older or women 55 or older or you need to have someone sponsor you for a work permit. But the only way they can sponsor you, there has to be an Israeli. And how the fuck is an Israeli going to sponsor you if they don't even know you exist because you're behind the wall? Again, maybe the regulations have changed. This was my experience five years ago. It's probably gotten worse. And I remember him saying to me, he said, Shlomo, what would you do? What would you do if your entire life the only person of the occupying army that you saw and the only interaction you ever had with Jews were IDF soldiers who came in and raided you and arrested you in the middle of the night, put you under administrative detention, tear gassed your homes, cut off your water and electricity, arrested a bunch of your friends, and killed you and harassed you. He said, what would you fucking do? And I said, if you don't think that I would resist with every single fiber in my being, as long as I was alive to liberate myself from this colonial hell, you are out of your fucking mind. I said, how dare you even ask me what I would do? I said, do you know my ancestry? Do you know who I come from? Do you know that my lineage? I had, my grandfather survived Auschwitz, Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, Hanukkah. You think I wouldn't fight back? That was after six hours. Can you imagine what 18 years, what 30 years does to the psyche of someone like that? And y'all sit here and get confused with Palestinian resistance? Are you kidding me? All that shows me is that A, you have no idea what the settler colony of Israel is, and B, it's disrespectful. You're disrespecting yourself because you're telling me that if you were in that position, you wouldn't fight back and you would willingly die. And that tells me that if I was in Auschwitz with you and we were in the bunkers, you wouldn't resist our Nazi captors. And that is someone I don't trust. So let's fucking get it together and start telling the truth and take this seriously. Let's fucking free Palestine for all people, for all people, everyone on the left.